Welcome to the Timmy James Show, I'm your host, Timmy James. Now, last episode, we were talking about The Room, you know, the movie, The Room, with Tommy Wise. I did not hit her, I did not hit her. Oh, hi, Mark. Yeah, that one. And, um, yeah, we are listening to an interview from the... Uh, Guy who claims to be the real director of the room and says that t- Tommy Wiseau did everything else. Now, I didn't play all of that interview in the last episode because I didn't really have enough time because I can only record for 45 minutes, but here's the other part of that interview. And then we'll hear from the man, the myth, the legend. Tommy Wiseau himself, I haven't got him here, but um, I will hear an interview with him, and then I'll I'll compare the stories and try and work out who really directed the room. So yeah, here's, um, here's the rest of the interview with the guy, I can't remember his name, it's Sandy something, but um, they'll say his name in this. But anyway, let's just jump into it, okay? I learned how to do a directly proper love scene, which I have done several of them, many of them since. Um, And I thought it was kind of tasteful. You know, a script supervisor is thought of as a silent director for the, if your director's on his first or second project, Um, although I'm not so silent all the time. Um, We are shot makers we're on set editors. We put this together. So I was the perfect choice. Any guy like me, you know, you could pick any guy in this crew. You could pick any guy in this slot, shove them into that spot. They would have done the exact same thing I did. Luck of the draw. Because someone needed to do it. But, he, asked, but he blatantly asked you to do it. Oh, he blatantly said, you will say action and cut. You will direct the actors. You will tell them what to do. You will do the camera. <laughs> I directed it. Everything a director does, I did. Tommy, nothing, not once, not ever. So that's the big lie. And it, after eight years, it annoys me to no end. It would annoy you too. Yeah, if we took full credit. If somebody keeps lying about something you did, no matter how bad it is or how good it is, eventually you're going to get pissed off. Mm-hmm. Who wouldn't? Where's my money, Denny? Where's my fucking money? Oh, the Chris R. Now that's Dan Janjigian. I've been friends with him for years. Why is there a criminal on the roof of his building with a gun? I don't know. What drug money? I don't know. Stories usually have something leading up to why a scene is in a movie. I have no idea. Was it because it felt like it was an American thing to do? I don't know. I think it was because Tommy wanted to feel the hero. And that's what they did. Oh, yeah. Now, Tommy, we show, and Johnny, they are one and the same. This is not Tommy playing a character. 
This is Tommy playing himself and renaming himself Johnny. This is Tommy's alter ego, fantasy, whatever it is. It's all him. So when you direct Tommy Johnny, you have to be very fast on your feet because things are changing constantly, (laughs) which is a lot of fun. And I had a blast. Bottom line, I had a blast making this movie. But I did make it. And I had a, it was a fun. Mm, it's constant dancing around the angles. And what, I, what do you need? What do you need? Getting my three pages going, what? And if I directed the three, three pages fast enough, his assistant would run in and stuff a 20 in my pocket. I got tips. You got tips as a director? What director in Hollywood ever got tips? I would I, never. I got tips. Can I just say, in a million years, I would never think to ask you that question. <laughs> Did you get tipped? Yeah, who would? So you got tipped because I you shot tips. faster. If I shot faster, if I finished the scene t- in a timely fashion, I got a tip. I still keep one of those 20s framed because that's the funniest thing I ever saw. I couldn't wait to get there in the morning. I would laugh my ass off because everything would go wrong all day long. It was fun. There's a scene uh, with Tommy... Denny and that mysterious guy, the sweater guy, are in a corner playing football three feet. Where did you shoot that? Was that also on the stage? On the stage. Everything was there. There were moments where I would just remember making a movie nobody's ever going to see, where I would turn to Graham and say, dude, where you lit? Oh, we're still lit in that corner. Great. The next scene's going to be in this corner. And I would just build it up because it was faster and it's already lit. And who cares? Who cares? And then have fun with the characters in the dialogue. Make it bigger. Do this more. Get this over the top. Breast, breast cancer? Are you, are you kidding me? Breast was she, cancer? What, okay, fine. Did the askers, actors ever ask you about what's going on? Only constantly. <laughs> Sandy, help! <laughs> Change this! What about the actress who played Lisa? She seems, her weight seems She's to go up and... She's a very nice girl. There's a comment in the movie that people say that her weight goes up and down. Didn't change at all. No. What you have is a wonderful costume designer, but inexperienced. And a very experienced costume designer would dress her in such a way that she would look consistent. She doesn't look consistent because she's not being costumed consistently. Uh-huh. Not the costume designer's fault. She never Give her another 20 years of experience and yeah, she'll fix that. But at the time, no. And did, she was a wonderful, you make sure that that's in there. This was a wonderful crew of wonderful people. All trying their best to survive this project without any significant brain damage. <laughs> Flat out scene I have to ask you about. Please. Lisa and her best friend are talking about Tommy, and Lisa's leaned back, and every shot of her, when she talks, her neck moves. Her neck bone. Did you notice that? Sure. What would you suggest I do to fix it? I'm out of ideas. (laughs) (laughs) I got a cameraman looking at me going, what? Let it ride. We're making a movie nobody's ever going to see. Who cares? Just let it ride. There's nothing I can fix there. So, but you saw it, you were aware of it, and you're just like... What to fix? How can I fix this? You can give me a suggestion right now, Adam. How can I fix that? I don't know. I don't know either. I'm not, I, here, just, let I'm not here to change it. Yeah, yeah let it ride. Whatever. They kept going to the kitchen. Does anybody wonder? There's no kitchen door. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah, they just walk straight out. <laughs> they just leave the scene. But even the party scene, at the end, people are walking in. They yeah. say, hey, let's all go outside. The party scene. And what does Tommy say in the party scene? Yeah, we better leave. It's getting a little weird in here. Man, talk about foreshadowing. <laughs> talk about encapsulating everything. That should have been the title. It's getting a little weird in here. Where did the room title come from? Do you have any idea? None. We shot it in one room, maybe. I don't, I don't know. Not my script. In Hollywood, the vast, vast majority of directors are just working guys. Look, your agent gets you a gig. I, I got how I'm here. I got a gig. Uh, You get hired by a producer, the producer's the boss. If the producer tells you, this is what I would like to see, if you object, you discuss. Otherwise, you go, "Mm, okay, we'll shoot it that way. Uh, Creative choices can go, there's no right and wrong. You know, maybe I'm thinking up, the character should be in a blue dress. And the producer says, no, no, I want him in a red dress. Well, you're paying the bills, fine. Red dress it is. Mm -hmm. I think of a film set as 100 directors... And one electrician. Everybody has an opinion. That's true for this show, Super Ninjas. That's true for any show, any feature. Everybody's got an opinion. The job is, do your department, do your job. Let the director do his job. It's his vision. We all have a vision, but his is the only one that counts. We have to be consistent with that. I'm a great believer in that. 
that each job has its edges. Try not to overlap anybody else's. You, we may all be able to just set that planter where it needs to be, but no. That is the set dresser's job. Let him set it. Otherwise, you are interfering in his lane. You are pissing on his job. Don't do that. So it's a set dressing. There was a TV that's facing the wall. Why is that? Was that to fill the bad screen? Bad reflection. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had a bad reflection. Yeah, turn the TV around. Who cares? Turn it around. So there's no justification nah, why I was there. No, nah, no, nah. There's a lot. But, yeah, I'm not the only one doing that. I mean, what, what do we got in here? What are those? Uh, why? Do, okay. Uh, a phrase I repeat, repeated frequently on set. What are these characters doing here? Why does Tommy love Denny so much? Why does he want to adopt him? And why, in God's name, does Tommy want me always to have him carrying a football? I don't know. Sandy, Denny has to carry a football. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever. Give the man a football. How old is Sandy, that kid? Sandy, why am I carrying a football? I don't know. Just carry the football and shut up. <laughs> How old is that guy for real? Do you think? I don't know. He's very young. Did you, I, I like to watch. Did you, yeah. Wow. And they cut it into the movie. Wow. wow. Did you, I mean, did you Speechless. assume they'd never make it? You'd assume that scene would never, someone would stop. 99%, 90% of what we shoot in Hollywood, and I'm talking the real stuff. Right. We're never on sees the, we're, the light of day. We're sitting here on the back lot of Paramount. Most of this stuff, uh, features, never see the light of day. They get made. Somebody goes, we're going to get screwed on this. Let's cut our losses, shelve it, and we'll go on to our next project. That's, that's what happens. And that's what you assumed? I s assumed that I was making a movie nobody would ever see and that I could have the time of my life with it, and I did. Every scene a mile over the top. Now, people love this movie because every scene is a mile over the top. Right. That's not Tommy, that's me. It just is. But I think part of the lore is that they think this guy did it seriously. And they think that... He was. Yeah, okay. Well, then Tommy still, was still doing there. it seriously. All right. We were all making a comedy. Mm -hmm. Tommy gave me the very serious, in quotes, serious dialogue that I would do a spit take trying to read because this is so stupid and hilarious. Breast cancer? Yeah, just thrown away. I never loved your father. Isn't that what she throws out at the party? Yes, but I never loved your father. Oh, well. Well, Lisa says, yes, and I'm pregnant. And then she explains it to her mother. Oh, yes, I, I'm not, but I just said that to make things interesting. Interesting? For who? The Marquis de Sade? <laughs> interesting. I don't, okay. I thought it was interesting. Did you shoot the scene where Tommy kills himself? Mm, well, attempts to, yeah. Shot everything but his two love scenes. Oh, okay. So, everything so you're saying he scenes. doesn't kill himself? With the gun that I guess he got from Chris Hart? Did he get that gun from Chris R? I don't know. Because that was... I don't know. It's just there. So there's no explanation why the Did you ever see The Highlander? Are... Yeah, yeah. Great film, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, the movie starts. Christopher Lambert is in the nosebleed seats watching a wrestling match with his knees up to his chest. Two seconds later, he pulls a six-foot broadsword out of his coat. Where did the sword come from? Who cares? It's a movie. Right. It's a big lesson there. And I've worked with Russell Mulcahy. Oh, okay. who directed Highlander on another movie. project. He's a wonderful director, wonderful. A little squirrely, a little hard to follow physically because he's moving like the speed of light. This is the Energizer Bunny. I like him very much. He's a wonderful director. So I did a pilot with him uh, on a series. I can't remember the name of it now. And I had a character getting out of a swimming pool in a Speedo set of trunks and holding up car keys. And I said, Russell... Where did he get the car keys? And Russell turns to me and goes, I don't know, where'd the Highlander get his sword? I learned a big lesson. We're making movies. Good. We're not making biographies. We're making movies. We don't have to explain everything. The gun, it's just there. Who knows? It's not really. Chris R. just shows up. Just there. Oh. I have no explanation. And did you hire him? Was that a friend of yours that you brought no, him? I didn't hire anybody. I didn't hire anybody. I made friends that I'm still friendly with today. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were a couple of juicers that came in that I knew previously on other projects. If you do this long enough and you get the gray hair, you're going to know everybody. Man, if I get on an airplane and go shoot in Sweden, I'll know people on the crew. It's a small community. You may feel big, but it's not. It's not. We know it. We all know each other. So you're saying that the, just to jump back to the vodka and Anything scotch, you, you have no, 
They just pulled it out and nobody said, hey, you can't mix vodka and scotch. What are you, you looking for accuracy here? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, please, you're talking about the wrong movie. Okay. Wow, you're, you're looking at the drink that shouldn't be mixed with vodka, and I'm thinking, breast cancer? <laughs> you just, like, finish it. Again, well, is that the prop cares? department That's or is that Tommy? Huh? Is that the prop department? Yeah. They just didn't mix it put with it. It's fine, whatever, it's just mix it. Yeah, most of it was like, yeah, whatever, just put that in there. I just want to get the shot. I want to make it look right. I want to get the feel for it. I want every scene to end where I mentally hear the upbeat of an organ in my head. Da -da -da! What's going to happen next? I don't know. You don't know. You didn't know either. And I never knew. I was always so shocked when I got my pages. Like, have you gone? Whoa. Have you gone to one of the screenings after oh, that yeah. time? Well, I went to that one where I first saw everything happening, and then. Uh, no, I have no. Just that one was scary enough for me. Um, although I get people all the time. The crew in L.A. tend to know that I directed this. Good. Thank you so much for understanding. Adam, the a show great is pleasure. Super Ninjas. Yeah, Super Ninjas, man. Uh, we'll talk more later. Please do. This is uh, this is excellent. I really was appreciate it? it. Yeah. You get what you needed. Oh my God. This is great. It was a pleasure meeting you. Yeah, you too. All right. Good job. Good Thank job. You. Thank appreciate you. it. All right. Yeah, got it. Thanks for listening to Proudly Resents. Make a comment or suggest a film at reachadam at mac.com. That's reachadam at mac.com. Or. Well. Hmm. So, I'm still contemplating, like, it's just a really weird story now, because we've got plenty of time left, I'm going to play the full interview with the one only, the one and only T -T Tommy Wiseau, alright? And then we'll talk about it after. Okay? Alright. My guest is definitely one of a kind. He has written, directed, produced, and starred in one of the most unique films you will ever see in your life, The Room. On May 6th and 12th, it will be showing in 700 theaters in America and Canada, thanks to RiffTracks.com, who will be offering their commentary. He has inspired the hit book The Disaster Artist, which is now being turned into a motion picture directed by James Franco. His new sitcom, The Neighbors, offers nothing less than the typical was so... Um, magic. He is shadowed in mystery, bathed in bizarreness, and I can guarantee you there is nobody else in the world like him, and there probably will not be for a very, very long time. Please welcome Tommy Wiseau. Oh, hi, Tommy. Hi, Doug. How are you? I'm wonderful, wonderful. Let me just start off by saying uh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, all seriousness, I think this is very, very awesome of you to come on here and do uh, this interview, so I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, thank you, too. I mean, the reason I'm doing it because, you know, I think people should understand that I'm pro-freedom, and that's why, as you know, we approved the riff track idea about uh, screening and talking about the room. I always say you can laugh, you can cry, you can express yourself, but please don't hurt each other. There's nothing wrong with it. If somebody uses somebody's material, make it fun of it. As long as they pay for license, questionable, right? Move on, next question. <laughs> next question. First question. Here we go. Um, I was going to say, before their riffing of the room, were you a fan of riff tracks? And what did you think of their commentary of your film? Well, let me say this. is uh, I'm not a fan of the riff track. 
for weather, let's just straight out the records here. I support them. The reason for it, because some people, including myself, we are pioneer of the new entertainment in Hollywood. And I think people don't grasp this, you see. And America is about to express themselves. So I think uh, you as well, uh, Red Track people, you are pioneer on a certain entertainment when people will say, hey, this is funny, or, or uh, let's just do this. The studio system right now, they say, wait a minute, actually, maybe it is entertainment, you know what I'm saying? I totally know what you're saying. My movie never will be produced by the studio system, let's face it, let's be realistic here, that's a fact. It's a good guess on your part, I agree. Okay, good, here you go. People don't realize the concept of that room, what was behind it. But anyway, it's your floor, so ask questions, whatever. <laughs> you know, I... Uh... That is actually exactly what I want to talk about. I want to ask you uh, about The Room. You know, your movie has inspired uh, uh, so many, namely yourself, and I know a ton of people who go into that movie and they, honest to God, say to themselves, by God, I can be a better filmmaker. And I'm wondering, what is it like to inspire so many people on such a grand scale? I think it's a, a flattering, and then the way you describe right now, yeah, of course, we have many. Hold that just a minute. Now, who's sucking who's dick? <laughs> because it sounds like they're both blowing smoke up each other's butt. It's just crazy, like, to tell me why I say, saying, oh, I don't look. Li- I'm not really a fan of riff tracks, but, like, I wanted them to do this thing for my movie. And I'm like, what the fucking hell? And he claims to be American. He's not an American. He's just an idiot. <laughs> well, he's not an idiot, but, like, he's just crazy, eccentric. But, yeah. You know who he really sounds like, though? Before we get back in the, the thing, you want to know who he really sounds like? He sounds like fucking Serge from Beverly Hills Cop, you know. I name Sage. Sage. N- not Serge. Sage. Sage. Hello, I'm Sage. Hello, Axel Foley. Hello, Aquel. Axel Foley. Axel, would you like an espresso with a lemon twist? Alright, never mind. Never mind with that bullshit. Let's just get back into this thing. Alright, let's go. Many talented filmmakers across the world, especially in America. But the fact also is that uh, I believe original material. You know, I always say to any person who tries to be a filmmaker, I say, who? Well, you may make it fun of my movie, fine, but guess what? On the end of the day, as you said, is the original material? The answer is yes. You know, sometimes it could be also not flattering, as you know, <laughs> but you have to accept it, you know? You have to be optimistic, and that's where I come from, and that's why we have this interview, because I think uh, we live in America. I think uh, we like to put uh, what we want to uh, say about you know, our lives sometimes, and sometimes it's just too much when people are misleading, as you probably know about it, about my life, and I'm American, yes, I do have accents, so what, so be it, you know? Move on, next question. Next question. When this film came out a lot... I did not hit her, I did not hit her, I swear, I did not hit her. Oh, hi, Mark. Who the fucking douche? I can't even sit here and listen to this fucking interview. Like, uh, he's just crazy, like, saying, I'm American, but I got an accent, so what? Yeah, if you were an American, you'd talk like this. You'd be like, Hello, my name is Tommy Wiseau, and I directed The Room. You wouldn't be like this. Hello, my name is Tommy Wiseau, and I directed The Room. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I directed The Room. I'm an American, and I... I'm an American, and I got... I got this accent. I don't care, though. I 
but I got this accent and I love riff. I hate riff tracks, but I love what they did with my movie. Fuck off, Tommy. Seriously, just fuck off. <coughs> <coughs> just fuck off. Right back to wherever you came from. Get back on the boat you came from. And just never make any more movies again. Because, see, you're the reason why I haven't watched the room yet. Because people, heaps of different people keep saying different things and all that. And I'm just going to watch The Disaster Artist. And yes, you're in that too. But I'll watch it anyway. Because I like James Franco and his brother and Seth Rogen. Who made the movie. Not The Room, but the movie The Disaster Artist, which is based on the making of The Room. Now, I've done riffing. Let's just get back into it. A lot of people realize that it dared to ask the question, why would grown men dress in tuxes and play football? And I was wondering if there was any part of you that felt maybe people didn't understand the film. Do you think the majority understand it and they get it or they're missing something? Well, they're missing something because, because again, this is the thing where the parody comes that sometimes I say it's okay when people use it, let's say, three-minute parody or whatever. I'll be honest with you, Doug, I'm straightforward against when people use the original material, they don't pay for license. That's my straightforward, you know? Well aware, yeah. Answer the fucking question properly. But you're still going on about the fucking material. Alright, let's get back into it. Weather. It's a, it's a gray area where people don't understand that it's nothing wrong when people say, hey, I don't understand what, the, what, what is this, the room is about, you know? So I see some of the audience actually have on the change that they say, what did I watch right now, you know? So Hollywood uh, was not ready for something different. We, we changed the, the crew four times, not three times, not two times, four times. We change the actors. We can talk about probably for two hours, but I want to. I don't want to just talk about myself. It's your floor, so you're the reporter. <laughs> the subplot, one of the big subplots in the film, uh, is with the child character Denny and the powerful anti-drug message that clearly you practice in real life. And coincidentally, at the exact same time, there was a sharp drop in LSD and ecstasy sales. The exact same year this movie came out. <laughs> Tommy, do you think this film was powerful enough to influence people to get off drugs? You, you are pulling my legs, dog. But no, I, you never know, man. You never know. But let me tell you this way. This is a good question about drugs. I, why I put the drugs? Why I put it is that the supposed to be a play. Okay, and I condense everything to, to 90 minutes. And I will have everything there. So you have... This guy's a fucking idiot. He's like, oh, I, I, I put the drug seal on the table. Oh, just Go back to wherever you fucking came from, Tommy. And I'm not being meaning to be racist or offensive to people of other nationalities, but you just drive me nuts, Tommy Wazo. And let's just see the rest of the interview. A little Caesar salad, but there's nothing wrong with that. So to respond to your question, I do not know. I know one thing, that two is better than three, three is crowd. That's what I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you yourself can't remember why? Two is better than three, three is a crowd. Yeah, that's what I know. What the fuck are you going on about, Tommy? What the serious fuck? You stupid fucking man. You're just fucking stupid. Right, just going, oh, that's what I know. Nobody cares. Anyway. Let's get back to hearing this idiot speak. Why you put in the Denny drug subplot? 
Oh, absolutely, I do. Absolutely, but I'm just saying I do not know if my movie influenced that people are much more aware about drugs issue. I know one thing that when people are watching the thing twice, it is wrong. Okay. Number one, the, the thing that you got to realize, if you're listening to this and you're like, you've got no idea about the movie The Room, this isn't the reason why everybody stopped taking drugs and why a drug price, uh, why the drug sales went down. It's got nothing to do with that. Tommy heard that, heard the interviewer saying that, so he's going along with it. It's the only reason. It's got nothing to do with the movie. Alright, let's just get playing it. When people started hating, which we have a couple bit apples, as you know, uh, but it, it, again, this is the thing, but you have to accept it. You know, it's different cookie cutter from Hollywood. That's the room. Okay, I think I followed that. Um, there have been many different interpretations uh, of this film from many different people. Some see it as a dark comedy, some see it as a drama, others as an alibi. But in this case, I think with The Neighbors, the new show that you're doing, it is intentionally a comedy, and you've shot all these episodes. What can you tell us about the making of this new show? Because you're totally in control of this, correct? Right. Well, The Neighbors is slightly different with The Room, but you see... I learned from my teacher, she's now probably 80 or 90 years old, something like that, she's still alive. Very simple thing, the more colors you have. But the question is how you put the colors. Colors what I mean. All right, they're obviously not talking about the room anymore. They'll probably get back into it, but I want to watch your show now, The Neighbors. Sounds interesting. But if you hear in this interview, well, no, I'm not going to play it any anymore, so you won't hear it. But, like, you know, I'm just saying, remember when fucking the director said, he's like, oh, this movie, Tommy said it was going to be a drama. And now he's claiming the bear comedy. This is exactly what he was talking about. Now, I'm just going to stop it right there because I don't really want to listen to this guy talk anymore. So, I'm Timmy James. I don't give a fucking bye-bye. The Timmy James Show 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 The Timmy James Show